adventure and the most frustrating adventure that I think I've been on as it deals with trying to uh, bring forward education needs for children. So today I'm going to talk about contracts. Uh, I gave you a copy of uh, generally what I'm going to be speaking on. And I, I'm not going to get into the weeds of contracts, but I want to kind of talk, and I've got some handouts I'll hand out uh, through this too. You know, when you're in a school board, our district is a $54 million organization. Of that 80% or so, actually 86% goes to salaries, employee contracts. So there's 500 contracts that deal with those two big collective bargaining agreements. But within that, your residual is all based on goods and services, what people want in your district, and you, they want access to you, and you know the district needs services. So big ticket items like uh, buses, new buildings, curriculum and textbooks, everything your district buys comes under a contract. And the board ultimately uh, has the authority uh, to deal with and authorize those contracts, which was an interesting story that I'll talk about in Springboro. But uh, so everything you do from sports memorabilia to your yearbook is a contract to teachers going on trips and traveling is a contract when the buses come and take kids to school. It's a $300,000 contract in Springboro. Everything you touch as a board member usually comes under some sort of contract or agreement. And none of us are lawyers and none of us are experts. And so the real issue is what do you do about it? Generally, in education, there's two types of ways to contract. The big ticket items, like buses, is through an RFQ or an RFP, Request for Proposal, Request for Qualifications. Your lawyer is an RFP, Request for Proposals. So if you have a lawyer, he's on a contract with you under some sort of terms and conditions, and you establish those terms and conditions as a board member. It's your policy direction that establishes the guidelines of the contract. Um, normally, there's multiple vendors that you would go to for an RFP or an RFQ. And ultimately, the, the theory is you're supposed to take the lowest price, the lowest vendor, but you can go outside of that under certain terms and conditions, and you just have to check with your administration or your legal counsel. The other kind of contract, which are not as often, is negotiated contracts. And I'll give an example one in Springboro. We had a chiller in our elementary school blow up. And our business manager had to go out and get with somebody to put an air conditioning compressor unit for $125,000 in that building. Well, we ratified that contract after the work already started because it was an emergency situation. The intent of that would be that he went and got the best price by talking to certain vendors. Ironically, one vendor happened to have that exact chiller sitting on his lot, and ergo, we now have a chiller that was done in about a two-week period of time. So there are certain contracts that administrators could go out and just negotiate one off. Um, even your health care is a contract. So we just think about that. And, and really, the, the overarching reason of why you pay attention to your contracts is that if you have a better price service that's delivering the goods for your children, which is what we're talking about, contracts for kids, then you should have more money to spend on teaching your kids. More competitive contracts leads more revenue in for things that students need. So, um, but I'm curious, what the title of this is District Contracts That Benefit Students. I'm wondering if, you know, what exactly does that mean to you here? I mean, is there any feedback or any ideas of what you would think a contract is that benefits a child in your district? Teacher contracts benefit kids? Okay. Okay. I, I'm a new school board member, so what? What would be a contract that wouldn't benefit kids if you're looking at putting the kids as the top priority of what the school board is supposed to do? So therefore, everything that you do as a board member and every contract you sign should be directly towards the benefit of the child? Yes, that's what I um, Teacher contracts are interesting. Yes, sir? I'm sorry, but my question really refers to your previous slide uh, when you said uh, low, looking for lowest price. Um, sometimes that doesn't always give you the best value. Correct. And so, how is that woven into the contract uh, uh, consideration and negotiations? Make sure you get the best value. Well, and, and in our district, we spend a lot of money with our lawyer. And so, when we have those questions about value and price, there's parameters that, as a policy board and as a governing body, you can actually negate 
the lowest price for the value that you think is better. But there are some steps that you have to go through with regards to that. I don't know if that answered your question. But it, a little bit. It, it, eventually, it, it, there's judgment that has to be involved, you know, which is not necessarily uh, well laid out. You know, it comes down to some um, opinion. Well, we had a $135,000 roof contract that we're ordering, and we've got another $400,000 roof contract. So the question is, is the 30-year roof better than the 15-year roof? Is the, gray, is the gray matter better than the blue matter? Is the insulation level at R13 better than the R7? And of course, again, I don't know how many people are in the contracting business here, but that's probably not one of our expertises. Uh, I happen to be in that, so I pay a little bit too much attention to that sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, but those areas of discretion or those areas of setting the standard for your proposal is how you get to discern what, you, what, your, what your best value is. And you, by setting that up front in the request for proposal or the request for uh, qualifications, gives you some of that flexibility. What about conflict of interest parties? Where you might have a contract, maybe uh, an official hire somebody, uh, maybe not through the school board. I'm, I'm not a school board member, never have been, but I like to watch some of the finances. And uh, I know a situation where uh, someone hired a person to do X, and uh, it was a relative of uh, 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 someone in the school. Well, you know, some, some, some boards have uh, their spouses in the school. Some board members have spouses in the school, and very interesting how those conversations are probably going on a daily basis and what's confidential as board members that we all see. Uh, I know that uh, you should avoid conflicts. As a board member, you should be the only group authorizing and executing a contract. And what's very interesting, and as an example in Spring Grove, uh, we found that uh, teachers were signing ninety and hundred thousand dollar contracts, uh, and uh, principals were signing sixty and eighty and forty thousand dollar contracts, never coming to the board of education. And I'll share with you in a, uh, some language from attorneys that you can actually take back with you and use for your uh, reading pleasure as it relates to what the authority is of a board when we talk about contracts. But, uh, so, so today what I'm really gonna, I don't know if I answered your question, did I, did I avoid conflicts? I mean, but you know. I kind of, I understand that. That's kind of the reason the question would be. Maybe the reason would be the authority of, say, a superintendent versus, you know, the school board, you know, if it was done by the superintendent and not by the, through the school board. Well, again, I'm not an attorney, but the opinion I'll share with you, there's only one body that can execute a contract. The superintendent has no authority unless the body politico, which is the board, has given some sort of resolution with parameters on what his authority is. If that does not exist in your district, then there is no contract that is bound. You can actually unwind every contract that was not voted on or signed by the president of the board and the treasurer. Now that's, but again, I'll give you an opinion from a law firm that we got, I took the law firm's name off because I'm not promoting them, but at least you'll see a question that we asked early on, or that I asked early on, because it's about, it's about the impressed versus implied authority. And there's really only one authority, it is the Board of Education. And people get confused with that. Matter of fact, many people get confused with that because you are the, you are the ultimate arbiter. But, and you only hire two people, but as it relates to contracts, you are the ultimate arbiter as the Board of Education. So I'm gonna talk about four things I'll try and talk a little bit about children, con what, what, what contracts are for children. Uh, I'm going to talk about the authority and I'm going to give you some information that you can take back with you and you can share with your legal counsel or whomever and see if it's right. I believe it's right. We, we operate at Spring Grove under that authority. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about curriculum contracts because I think that's a, another area that we as boards maybe get confused with what our authority is and, and, and believe it or not it's in the law about curriculum and how you execute and there's a lot of movement going on in our state and across the country today as it relates to the Common Core. And I'm not going to debate the Common Core, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, what I will say, though, is that with, with that or any change in curriculum and in standards comes new books. And that is going to be the most important place a policy board member should be paying attention to going forward. And they are a big business around that. And there's only one or two companies that are involved with contracting for education and books in this country today because they've been eating up 
every company. And I'm not going to get into the weeds of that, but I'll share with you the law as we get to that. And then I'm going to talk briefly about collective bargaining because in Springboro, we went through it. And it was the most antagonistic adventure I've ever been on in my life. And I will do the best I can to tell you where we think we went wrong and where we think who's what and where. And I'll talk a little bit about our experience and my experience on that. Uh, and I'll stop. And if there's a question, don't hesitate to stop me anywhere that we're at because I'll just use the whole time uh, with questions and answers as we go through. So contracts for kids. So we started off with everything in a school district is a contract for a kid. And that's true because, you know, your sports marketing contracts, your scoreboard contracts, your vending machine contracts, your Pepsi contract that's supposed to give you money back is your contract. It's not the booster's contract. It's your contract. Should you share it with the boosters, that's your prerogative, but that's your contract. Why? Because they promote student achievement. It's the well-roundedness of what we want in education. License agreements, very interesting. Everybody has a logo. People are selling your shirts. They're selling them in your buildings. Really, it's your logo. You can license them to whoever you want, just like private schools do. Springboro, we license it. We give the right to our boosters to use it. We can also take that right away, and in Springboro, we had a $439,000 booster scandal that maybe some of you read about or didn't read about because we asked questions about where the money is, which is a policy that will, you guys all have policy books. New board members, I suggest you start reading your policies because your policies are what you govern as part of your contract authority. New bus contracts, why? We hadn't bought buses for years, and there's only two companies that make buses, so you don't get to negotiate much. One bus, other bus, they're all yellow. <laughs> but if your buses aren't working, there's a cost on your mortgage district, and you have to figure out how to get a bus plan in place. But it's a contract. It's an RFQ. It's a contract. We bought 21 over the next five years, 11 in, made a decision to finance them. So financing the buses was a contract. Again, something that our finance committee went through in our district, which not many districts have. New computers, why? We bought 1,100 computers this year for our students. We're going to buy more. And every teacher has a new computer. We've wi fi our buildings. Each one of those items was a contract. 230000 with Dell, 430000 for Wi-Fi. Everything is a contract. But why? It's all for kids. It's all for education, 21st century learning environment. Curriculum I'll talk about a little bit more deeply as we get into it. But we're talking about online learning and online textbooks. We're getting rid of books. Book companies are saying, hey, why buy the million dollars worth of books in a contract? License the book with us for $50 and charge it to your parents. Maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's not a good idea. Pass on the fees, save you money? Don't know. That's where they're heading, though. And who controls what goes into the content of the book when they have automatic updates? All interesting things about the contracts that you're signing and the rights you have as a board and what your fiduciary is to your children. And then collective bargaining, is it really for kids or is it for adults? My experience was that it wasn't much for kids. That said, we need the professionals to teach the children. So the environment that you create around that is very important. But the issues that we dealt with with the Ohio Education Association, who came at Springboro very hard and fast and furious, and schools and leaders, I think I might have heard a conversation today, well, I respect what you do, but, but our administration says don't do what they're doing in Springboro. Well, that's probably okay. You don't have to do some of the things we did, we did wrong. You know, maybe we should have been in the news. And, Maybe the Huffington Post shouldn't have picked us up. Oh, okay? You know, and and maybe, that, maybe that is the wrong place to be, but, you know, to try and highlight the issues of what's going on in your buildings, you know. Mr. Gunlock gave a great speech today. I'm on everything he says, and I've been on, we have buildings in our district that is an excellent with distinction building with an F. Do you know where your buildings are? If you do, then it's your job as a policy board to set contracts and directions to go and fix those things. So, board authority. I'm going to give you, let me all pass this around. This is an opinion. Um, so, before we got onto the board, or before I was elected, about a year prior, I started getting engaged, trying to understand uh, what was happening in our budget, in our finance. We had failed five levies in spring break. And all this, and I, by the way, I lost my job in 2008, so I was one of those guys who was in the middle of the Obamacare beginning, where all of a sudden the insurance companies dropped everybody and raised prices, and here we are in Springboro, a big announcement, this is what got me engaged, so it's pretty crazy, what can engage people. A big announcement, 
we have changed our insurance plan. We put, a, put them on a big deductible, but it's only going to cost us $800,000 more a year. <laughs> so I said to myself, what does that mean? And this was in February of 2010. I sent an email to all the board members and to all of the, uh, and the administrators. And the only person after two times who responded back was Dr. Coles, who I met, who I'd never met before, and it was several months later. Um, and uh, interesting enough, it turns out that what we did is that we created a $4,000 deductible plan for families but gave them $3,200 each, which half of them didn't use, but they got the $3,200 anyway. And so it was a $1.7 million increase in our compensation and our expenses of the district. But that's another story. So as the board, it is your sole authority as the body politic and corporate capable of contracting and being contracted with. It is in the ORC code. I handed out a, a, uh, an opinion of law that I got as a board member because, I, because our, our administration, pre-administration to who we have today, did not know that it was not their authority to go sign the $100,000 contracts or to go sign the $50,000 contracts or to go sign the vendor agreements. They never brought them to the board. Is it onerous as a board member to see and hear the contracts? Yes. Do you understand what makes a good contract or not a good contract? Possibly not. We'll talk a little bit about some clauses that maybe have some value to you, but clearly most of the contracts that came to our board from vendors were all one-sided. They were they cancel when they want to, you never get to cancel, they automatically renew whenever they feel like renewing, and they charge whenever they feel like as it automatically renews. Now granted, remember, 87% is our collective bargaining agreement or our agreements with our ESCs, which is part of our compensation for our teachers, because teachers work for ESCs and you all contract with ESCs. By the way, multi-million dollar contract in our district, so your ESC contract for services is another contract that you actually have the ability of saying no. We took preschool back in Spring Grove from the ESCs, and we're running it according to our superintendent at a couple hundred thousand dollars less a year by bringing it internal. So we got, we changed the contract practice and brought it inside. Our children were still getting the same service, except now we have the teachers, we control the teachers, we control the curriculum for our preschool. So we opened up a preschool, removed it from a contract, brought it in-house, increased, increased our staffing, obviously, to do that. But the, the bottom line, the ORC code, 3313.17, 3313.22b, it is all about you. And that opinion I gave you is very detailed. It goes through case law. It goes through reasons why. Uh, everybody who has an attorney should ask for this. You should get an opinion like this from your attorney and give it to your superintendent. Because bottom line is, again, you are the body politic. It is your job. If a contract's out the door with a busing company for $95,000 and the kid gets hurt, they're going to sue you. Okay, again, I'm not a lawyer. And by the way, you can get sued a lot here for doing nothing. I mean, it's, it's rather interesting how many lawsuits we have on us for doing nothing. Because you really only hire two people, your superintendent's contract and your treasurer's contract. Those are also contracts. And they all come with a bunch of standard terms and conditions, which you can negotiate. Any questions on this? So what I'm, again, I'm going to reiterate it again. There is no contract that is binding by a Board of Education if it is not executed by a vote and signed by your president and your treasurer. They can do it in lump sum type of mass agreements. You can do it any way you want as the board, but that's where it is. If you have contracts that are illegal, you raise this question and go ask for a copy of every contract in your district that's been executed outside of the president and the treasurer, it would be interesting to see what answer comes up. You would have to go back and re-ratify all those contracts, which you can do in law, or cancel law if you feel like it. Now, you might not want to cancel the vending guy who does the yearbook, but, you know. Uh, you might want to read your yearbook contracts, too, by the way, in Spring Road. It's a 45% markup as a fundraiser, but there was nothing noted in anything that we disclosed to our parents. The contract was signed by a teacher. So now what we did is, is that we're okay with the fundraiser, which went into your principal's 018 account, which is his general account to go spend money. Hmm. So 001 account in school finance is your general revenue. You all vote for your 43 or 44 or $45 million, whatever your budget is in your five-year forecast. That's an 001 account. Within that are a bunch of contracts, $40 million worth of expenditures. Your principal has an 09 and an 018, and that's kind of their, their slush accounts. 
And they go and sign contracts with people which they have no authority to do. They can't sign the vending contract with the vending machines they want. They just have to recommend it to the board, and you guys approve it. You can also decide where the money goes if you don't want it to go into their account, or you can help direct it better, or ask what he's going to do with it. Again, all those contracts are in your building, so no authority comes from anybody but you. And then, if there's an error, I gave you the citation from the Attorney General's opinion in 2005, 0033. You'll just have to get your attorney to look that up. So you're easily able to go back and ratify all of those contracts that may have been missed. You still want them. There may be nothing wrong with the contracts, but at the end of the day, it is the board's authority. It is only the board's authority. The board is the only authority. Now, when you give the contract away to whomever, then you're operating under that authority. If you decide to cancel it, you would be bound by the problems that are associated with canceling a contract. And if you don't pay attention to the cancellation clauses of your contracts, what do they want if you decide to cancel? Well, you may find out you can never cancel because of the way your contract was written. And that's okay. You may like the Pepsi guy to always be Pepsi and don't want Coke. It's all right. Are the contracts available to citizens? Absolutely. You just have to do a request of record for any contract you want. Public records. Readily available. So what I did, and what was very frustrating to some, and, and you know, in our district, we had a complete turnover practically of all of our administration. Why? Because they said the policies of the board were going the wrong direction. Let's see, we bought computers, we passed the renewal level, we bought buses, we're fixing roofs, we're buying books. You know, we're going in the wrong direction. We just weren't educating people enough. The wrong direction. But that's okay. We're going to have the best year ever with all of the things that we've given the tools for our teaching staff, including a $7 million raise over two years, which is pretty good when you think about it. And we still have a surplus in Spring Grove. So if we're doing it wrong in Spring Grove, paying attention to things, so be it. That's okay. The good news is, is that we have money in the bank, we have resources allocated, and we made the administrators put a plan together before they came to us with a contract. So think about a technology plan for your school that shows a list of items that you want to be spent on an annual basis that comes with a contractual obligation or direction that you as a policy board are voting on. Or think about a bus plan. How many buses do you need? What's the useful life of your buses? Or think of your textbooks. A textbook plan. What is it that, the that your curriculum director wants? What is that going to look like in a contracting cost? When is it going to be implemented? When can you bring it forward and can you afford to do it? So, ask questions would be my recommendation to all of you. It may frustrate people. If you don't get the answer you like, ask the same question again differently. If you don't get the same question answered, ask again. And if you still can't get the answer, ask for your attorney to give you an opinion. So this one's even more fun. This is the most unbelievable thing in life, curriculum. You all, under the code, are responsible for curriculum. And here's the site out of the ORC code. So the interesting part of the law, just the first paragraph, the Board of Education of each exempted city, village, and local school district, and the Board of each cooperative education school district established, pursuant to the section of the code, shall prescribe a curriculum for all schools under its control. How many of you are curriculum experts? How many of you read or, or know what your teacher's lessons plans look like? Because that's your authority. They can't approve a lesson plan without coming to you for a recommendation and approve. It's part of curriculum. How many people approve the reading books on your list for all your classes? They can't get a book in a class unless it's approved as part of a lesson plan that comes to the board through the curriculum department to do that. How many people do that? Zero. It's all presumed it's there. Yeah. So there was a Howard Zinn book that showed up in Spring Grove. Somebody got really upset about that. So the governor of Indiana. And when we raised the question, where's the other side of the Howard Zinn book? Well, we didn't have an answer because, you know, you have a policy. And again, I'm going to say, if you get anything from me tonight, it's your authority. There are policies that you need to read, every one of you, because that is your Bible as it relates to your authority within your district. Sorry? Question. I got, I got a question. I, these are all great things. 
I'm assuming they come onto an agenda that's discussed at a school board meeting. How does something like this get put on a school board meeting? Or what brings it up? I mean, board members bring this to the table and I guess the treasurer puts the agenda together. The president of the board is responsible for setting the agenda and it's his job to go to the board members if they have any items. It's your job to work with the president through Robert's Rules of Order to get whatever agenda items you want on the agenda. If the president chooses not to, that is ergo his power under Robert's Rules of Order. You can ask your superintendent to bring something forward. If your relationship is good with the superintendent, he should be able to bring it forward to his agenda. Ultimately, your board member, you should have the authority to raise a question. When you vote, if you follow Robert's Rules of Order, which I suggest everybody look at too, you can mend your agendas at the beginning of every meeting. Usually, it's under Robert's Rules of Order. If the board has the authority to approve or disapprove a curriculum or books or whatever, we have a situation in our district where the administration decided to implement Common Core about two years ago and the board knew nothing about it. So does that make it null and void? Because it's a curriculum, I don't care what they say, it is a curriculum. Um. I'm not going to be your lawyer, but if you don't want to adopt the Common Core as a board, you don't have to opt in. Now, um, the, que the comment was that a couple years ago, uh, her board or her administration decided to go and follow what the Department of Education was promoting, which was to, uh, to begin focusing on the needs and the direction of the Common Core, the new standards of the Common Core. Her question was, she did not get asked to do that as a board member, is it now null and void? My answer, I'm not an attorney, I'm not your attorney, but my understanding is if you want to opt out of the Common Core based on this site, you can opt out of the Common Core. The question you'll have to ask yourselves, what will you opt into, and how will you deal with that? And that is the issue that, again, not a debate for Common Core here today, I'm an advocate for higher standards. The Common Core, as Mr. Gunlock said, is a minimum set of standards. It's the curriculum that you adopt with the Common Core is going to drive your level of education and what your children and the next generation will learn. So, and you know, I was called radical, extreme, unbelievable that you would ask a question about curriculum because, you know, a 900-page textbook gets shown up. They say they went and vetted it through parent groups and everybody else, and we think it's the best book around. Well, I didn't read the science book that got adopted. I mean, I did go to a couple areas like, what are they talking about evolution and did creation get in there to see if there's another side? Didn't quite make it, but that's another story. Um, not that I would promote it, but again, in Springboro, we did have a debate on whether how we teach these other sides of any issue, forgetting about what that is. Your decision as a board, how you manage through that. Now, that is a very big problem because you have an establishment that, for the most part, is on autopilot based on the curriculum that's in place. So, movement is stepwise, not jumping off a cliff. Although it takes a long time. So we were, we were considered to be, uh, we were playing politics by doing things and asking questions about curriculum. Uh, but you have to ask. It's your right. It's your obligation. It's your responsibility. If you advocate that and pass it off, then why are you on an elected board? I mean, that's what you're here for, children and community. So curriculum, in my opinion, will be... I think we've lost two generations in my, you know, so, so I work in the business world and it's interesting. We had a debate about career. This is how much curriculum is important. We had a debate in our district about career and college ready. And we decided we wanted to link with a big multinational top 50 fortune corporation in our backyard, Teradata and Motorman, global computer robotics company. And we said we'd like to have job training with these people to advance their career. And the first words out of the establishment and many people was sent them to the career center. That's where they're supposed to go. <laughs> and so the curriculum that we invest in your high school program of studies, which also is your authority to approve when you vote every January on your high school program of studies as a board, if you read it, you may find out that it hasn't been updated for 10 years and it may not touch what is college and career ready today. <laughs> And that is, again, your obligation. And we asked those questions, and now two years later, we're writing our high school program of studies. The first was a pounding. It went nowhere. New administration came in and said, hey, it's outdated. Look at all these other schools around us. They're actually offering dual credit as part of our curriculum, the contract that the board sets in place. 
They're actually offering PSEO at a higher level. The contract that the curriculum is there for that you set in place. They're offering ACT classes. The contract that you agree to when that board, that document comes in front of you. So curriculum is a contract. And it's the biggest contract you actually can impact as it relates to my next two years on the board, I'm going to be focused solely on curriculum. I think our budget is good. That was my first two years of a project. So, so I'll spend a few minutes a little bit. So curriculum, a contract. I'm going to just talk about maybe some things that I touched on briefly, but I gave you all a flyer of what's on my slides, of maybe some of the areas of a contract that if you're reading it and you're not an expert, you can kind of hone in on a couple of key bullet points. You can ask a question. You can get your lawyer to look at it. You can do whatever you like. So, um, you know, first of all, uh, assure balance. You know, obviously we need a service. It's important that we get the HVAC contract working. And your school, maybe we have a million square feet of facilities, so we have a contract that manages our HVAC, that our business manager does, but if we're canceled that with a company and brought a new one in, it saved $60,000 a year. Things like that you can do, which goes to the bottom line, to go to salaries for teachers, benefit increase if you have to, or new textbooks. Um, limit, you know, some of the contracts we saw were sort of these open-ended contracts. We'll sign it with you this year, but it automatically renews. No language about a letter, and, and these aren't big contracts. I mean, you're not going to get an automatic bus renewal contract. You're not going to get an automatic renewal of your collective bargaining agreement. Unless, you know, you have to negotiate those. But if you have a $40 million budget, 15% of that budget is roughly at your, well, the whole contract is your responsibility, but there are those discretionary contracts within that balance. Avoid termination penalties if you can. You know, usually I try to get mutual termination. We don't like you, you don't like us. Leave. Please, come. now, that, nobody likes that because they think, oh, I got all this work invested, but you know, you can ask. Uh, Non-performance, I mean, we had a, you know, here's one administration, which is no longer there, went and spent $170,000, give you two good examples of contracts. $170,000 to get our high school Wi-Fi ready to go. Well, this was in 2011, 2012. Everybody knew about PARC. Everybody, uh, PARC, the Assessment Online Testing, as part of the Common Core, I don't know what it stands for. Oh, by the way, we're going to probably opt out of PARC as a state after we spent $300 million. But that said, there's still going to be online modalities that you're going to want to, to have your kids learn about. So they Wi-Fi'd our, our 200,000 square foot high school building. The only problem is you couldn't get on it except if you're in the hall and you couldn't do online testing for any more than 20 or 30 people in a class. So that was a $170,000 contract gone bad that we had to go and spend $260,000 to fix. Sounds like Obamacare. <laughs> <laughs> well, we tried to do that in our collective bargaining agreement. That didn't work. Um, the other example of a curriculum contract, we got funny money from the stimulus program. And apparently somebody said go buy $170,000 worth of books. So somebody went and bought $170,000 worth of books and they're in their boxes under our staircase. I have a picture of them. Because the teachers didn't want to use them. Don't know why, don't know the answer, couldn't tell you, it wasn't there. But $170,000 of wasted money never went to kids. So, again, um, I've always kind of tried to say that the burden of renewal is not on the district. And that's going to be a big change, because that's not in any contract that I read in our district. And I read all of them to the point where I'm not a lawyer. I start just sending them to legal and make sure that I've got these five terms in the contract. Tell your, get your people who are negotiating, you understand your five hot buttons. And if they can't get them, then make a decision. We need this service, we'll deal with that. It's going to be for this period of time. Or, but you have to make that decision. It's not your superintendent. At the end of the day, you, know, you ultimately aren't going to negotiate them because they call you micromanager. But it is your responsibility and obligation to make sure the taxpayer's dollars are being spent in the most prudent way possible. And then exclusivity. Um, you know, we try to get out of that. The last, the last set of my slides are on collective bargaining. Um, the law and everything is all in favor of labor. Labor is important. You can't educate children without labor. The widget is the child. The machine and the engine is the teacher. The better the teachers, the better the program, the better the attitude, the better the kids feel. It's all about educating children and moving them from point A to point B in the continuum. Um, so your relationship with labor, when we got onto the board in 2012, there was this perception that we were going to make everybody cut their health care by 40% and save all this money. So immediately we were in this negative, the day, the first month on the board, we had more change.org things with us than we can shake a stick at. It was crazy. 
So, um, yeah, we've got 10 more minutes to the end of the session if you wanted to questions and answers. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's an arduous process. Uh, you make a decision if you want to make big changes, but really it all boils down to the money, benefits, and your step. And we spent $70,000 of legal fees, we rewrote our contract, and they rewrote their contract and took away all our rights, and they wanted a 27% raise a year. Nobody seemed to care, they felt that was appropriate. We rewrote our contract and said, hey, we just want you to work an eight-hour day. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, you, gotta, you, you, have to set, you have to set goals if you're going to get into your collective bargaining agreement. You're not going to be the expert. Um, you have to think about sustainability. So you have to have a philosophical policy as a board when you enter into relations with your labor. And hopefully it's good entrance into it because it can be easy or they can do what they did to us. And, you know, it's, you just remember strong as well. Um, you have to think about parity. So if you're going to get into your negotiations, I, I, I suggest that you, um, I mean, some of the things that we tried to set were look at uh, closely a fair share, reduce payout for accrued sick, eight hour work day, achieve parity with our community on health care. We did get a 5% concession, but we paid for it in a, in a bonus stipend. Um, reduce your supplemental contracts, take your sports supplemental contracts out of the collective bargaining agreement, set them aside. You guys deal with those separate, don't make it part of the negotiated agreement. And, you know, get language updates, you know, some of those things are there. Uh, language updates that were out there, minimize dispute resolutions, minim minimize out of class time. I mean, clearly you want the teachers to be in the class to teach, so you want, you want them there, you don't want the subs in teaching. Um, remove provisions that allow electioneering with school resources, you know, align with ORC codes and yardy issues. So there's a bunch of topics. I'll give you, I, I've got a handout for you if you want to do this, I'll give you one. Um, Here's some strategies for you that I highly recommend. If you're going to get into negotiations two years in advance, hire a public relations team separate from your PR company, start figuring out what your message is, and start hammering a message. It's extra money. At the end of the day, it could save you 5% on your insurance. It helps you communicate. If you rely on your internal machine, ours got bogged down. We had to hire a separate company. We hired them too late. Data. You need data. If you have a point you want to make, if you think your insurance is too gracious, or if you think your pay is too low, then demonstrate that you want to pay them more by virtue of everybody's getting more money, and you need to take less, pay more for insurance too. And you have to share, but you have to have that data that's rep, because the, o, the OEA will walk in your building with their forensic auditor and tell your staff and you that your five year forecast is wrong, is right. Now they didn't touch ours because we took all of the fake out of our five year forecast, and in Springboro, there are no assumptions in our five-year forecast that are false or bogus. It's actually from a five-page document to a 15-page document because we tell everybody what we are doing, what's in our numbers, why we're doing it, and when it's going to be implemented. Are, are you saying you don't have a, an annual percent increase of labor force cost? We are, in our five-year forecast, our labor increase is based on our contract term. If our contract term ends next year, our five-year forecast goes to zero increases. We have not negotiated anything, therefore how can you carry a package in your numbers? If our insurance contract says it's 80-20 for two years, and we know it's there, the third year our five-year forecast reflects a zero increase. People said that was extreme. It was radical. How do you budget something you don't know, setting aside a bunch of numbers that shows your forecast negative? Show everybody what the money is that we have at the table, which is what we did. And hopefully you have an amicable resolution to that. But you need data, you need to keep your schools open, and time is your enemy. And uh, they're all going to go after you for unfair labor practices, so they just, oh, you posted online your contracts, it's unfair. Oh, you sent out a press release and talked about your philosophies, it's unfair. And by doing that, it's part of the law, you'll never get to an impasse, and basically it's just, you might as well just figure out the real important aspects of your life. When you say time is enemy, the longer you wait, the worse it is to Correct. negotiate. Yeah, the closer you get to the point of when your contract expires. Oh, okay. That's the worst. Yeah. There you go. Those, those, I mean, yeah. 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 Well, that's why you do that because you right. Well, you do that because you're not. They don't want to negotiate. It's always a crisis. Everything comes last minute. You, and, and that's that is the strategy of the administration. Everything was last minute. Put me up against the wall. You got to decide on this today. Why? Well, if you don't, our health care is going to expire. Well, did you know that six months ago? Uh, and now, we have a new administration that's ahead of the curve. 
Our previous administration flowed that way. So philosophically, you might say changing seven out of eight of your administrators was a bad thing for the district. Operationally, our district was in a mess. And I'm an ops guy, so I can just tell you that. And you will hear from our treasurer now and in her own, uh, the other one couldn't stay, no. <laughs> she did a great job. She probably saved the district and got a levy passed. But operationally, she didn't. Our district cut our treasurer's capacity so much, a $54 million organization with three people running the books, all of a sudden you got a half-time treasurer and now your $40,000, $50,000 a year admin person is doing 17 different jobs while there's all these other compliance things that your auditors are going to ding you on because they're not doing what you're supposed to do under accounting. So, again, PR strategies for the unions. Well, they go the other direction. It's all your fault. They've got a playbook out there, and they make sure they open up a strike house if they're going to be contentious, or they pull their 10-day strike like they did with us, or they go quiet like in Fairborn. There's no contracts in Fairborn. I haven't heard a thing about what's going on in Fairborn, Ohio. They canceled all the union contracts, but there's no... Yeah, you know that, right? It's amazing. Yet we were negotiating. We're in the paper every day. Strategy. Um, they're going to mobilize the parents against you. They're going to tell you you're not going to, you've got to support the teachers. You're being mean to the teachers. Remember I told you we gave $7.5 million raise to our teachers who hadn't gotten a raise for five years or their steps were released because nobody was being honest with them on what the five-year forecast looked like and what your budget really was. So they were giving concessions over here that was a lie, and yet they blamed us, the new board, that we were the one that caused that problem. It was the most unbelievable PR campaign, and it worked wonderfully. <laughs> um, they're going to argue for fairness, but they don't tell you what that is. And again, time is their ally. So, uh, lessons learned on collective bargaining, start early, establish your PR team out of the gate, keep your superintendent out of the negotiating team. Uh, it's not for him to do, he needs to stay away from that. Uh, it's going to burn your staff up if you really go into real negotiations, which most districts are not ready to do. That's why you have to plan it early. We started with our attorney rewriting our contract in 2012. We tried to open up negotiations six months in advance. The union refused to do that. Why? Because time is on their side. They didn't sit down with us. They, they set up six schedules to negotiate. We could have done it for six months. Sir? When you say keep your superintendent out of the con negotiations, then who who is in there? Your lawyer or board member, your treasurer, but not your I mean, do you really suggest like a board member, two to yes. three? Yeah, we had, yeah. we had a board member that was on the negotiating team. Right. And the superintendent is acceptable with that? Uh, the, the superintendent in our case was on the negotiating team and it was a mistake in my opinion. So I would say in the previous negotiations in Springboro, the superintendent was not on the negotiating team. There was an assistant superintendent or a business manager or somebody else. Basically then you had an attorney who was like the point man, so to speak, Correct. or the point woman, right? Correct. That's what you took everything? Okay. Correct. He took everything from us as a board. Because, I mean, I'm just saying, and I suppose it would be depending on how big your school district is, but if you don't have an attorney going in against the OAA, you might as well just, you're like shark food. Right, well, we hired one specifically. Right. We hired an attorney specifically knowing, and we set aside a quarter million dollars in our five-year forecast to negotiate for legal fees. So we went out the door, and, and of course we did that publicly because... Yeah. We apparently knew we were going to have a problem. I mean, I always think as a new board member, I'd like to be part of that, but then there's a voice in the back of my head that says, <laughs> no, <laughs> stay <laughs> out of that room. <laughs> well, <laughs> but anyway. You know, at the end of the day, when it boiled down in Springboro, we changed our contract, and I sat down the day, week before it was going to be decided of where we're going to, how we're going to do this, and I asked our attorney, and I said, when you came and interviewed with us, you came with these two great things you got Lakota schools to do, and these were really big and powerful. I said, so you've now spent $70,000 on legal fees. What have you got when you walk out of Springboro? Okay, I said, any, any language? Did you, get, did you get, like, anything? Well, I got all your rights back that they wanted to take away. So then it all, to me, just became about money and benefits. And that's really where it was. So, uh, results? Well, I think we did a pretty fair job at the end of the day. We didn't get any language change, really. We did cut our health care costs a little bit. Um, I think by giving the staff raises, which I think they would have always gotten, and we went out the gate giving them raises day one. Just nobody wanted to talk about it. We went out the gate giving them more money day one but no one wanted to have that conversation. We asked for a few things, like an eight-hour day, but it wasn't necessarily to teach more to the kids, to the 
minimum 1,050 hours you teach in high school and 950 hours that your teachers are required to contract and teach in your elementary and lower grades. We're asking to give them more time to have with kids and with themselves. At the end of the day, they still work seven and a quarter hours in our district. That's their full day of work. I'm not saying they don't do work afterwards, but that's the contracted labor agreement. And uh, they ended up with uh, all their steps back, roughly 5% raises for two years. We got some changes that we thought were okay. Our budget is sustainable by virtue of adjusting some of our health care costs. Uh, we took some things out that would have been a, a raise and made them a one-time stipend so they don't carry forward in your five-year forecast. And uh, from what I heard, the teachers are happy. I guess they'll be happy with the next election that we had, too, because uh, they'll be a past administrator and a past teacher who will now be on our board. Uh, so we will be an interesting uh, go forward, and we have negotiations again in two years. So I get to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Coles. Yeah, I, I want you to talk about, um, a little bit more about having that superintendent on the negotiating team, and I was on the team. I didn't say anything. I just was there to listen. Uh, because honestly, this is my personal opinion, just like he gave it, but uh, both sides are really just one side. They're really, you know, everybody around that table is really one. And I didn't feel like the taxpayer representative was ever at the table, so we kind of insisted, because we had board majority, that one of us at least sit in. So I didn't say a word. I simply wanted to watch what happened. And the lawyer does all of the talking. And the lawyer brings forward what your board decided in executive session to bring forward. So they're just supposed to be an agent for the majority. But I agree. I think having the superintendent was a, a problem. But they will tell you that a board member doesn't need to be there. I found that to be a conflict because then I felt that the taxpayer didn't have a representative at that table. Because there's always me too clauses, even if they're not written, they're well known that then the administrator, treasurer, and anybody else that works in that district will get whatever they agree to. So again, everybody at the table is on the same side. Uh, I think the taxpayer's representative, which is board members, has to be there. Not to participate necessarily, but just to be there. And I think I would avoid having the superintendent there, just like you said. The supplemental contracts, were you able to get them out of the, the negotiated agreement? They came out through a MOU. So part of one of our MOU strategies before I got there, the sports supplementals right. were out. The teacher supplementals, which is over a million dollars in Springboro, are still there. And they're still negotiated and they still get steps and benefits on all of those. The, the sports contracts that came out still are part of their retirement process and goes into their STRS and everything yes. else. Yes, everything's the same. They're just not negotiated at the table for collective bargaining. Okay. Now, I would say that just because they're out, nothing has changed. <laughs> if the coaches are hiring more coaches, our supplementals are $700,000 a year, there's a gap in our sports program, and nobody seems to care. They just want to raise pay and play more. Again, you got to balance all those conversations in the contractual tenure, and it's very difficult when somebody's been making $7,000 a year as a head football coach all of a sudden say you're going to cut their pay and everybody gets upset. <coughs> you have to just, you have to time, but every, you know, supplementals, by the way, expire every year. Right. And try to, so the coach of five years has been there and you want to bring a new one in, that's a whole other interesting conversation. Yes, ma'am. Looking for some advice. Since I've been on the board this is my second year, I've been fighting for, I feel care. For a lot of, a lot of times they are forgotten, actually, and extra money they have to spend in the district. School supplies, sports fees, um, and, you know, on and on. And I, you know, I find, find out that just for the, the school pictures, the school gets kicked back up 30%. Ours is 45, like I mentioned. And <coughs> so I'm aware. And I, I just think that's all when the superintendent tells me, oh, the parents don't know how good they have it. Well, it's your contract. So we went and we made the picture company put on their on their form that the parents get. Please be advised that 45% of this is a fundraiser. You can opt out. If you opt out, here's the price. Really? We made if they if Yearling wanted the contract with us, and that's what we put on it. Well, that that's what I was advocating for. But you have to have a majority again. Yeah. Yeah, I never did that. No. And then they got the sports fees for the school fees. So yeah. The school fees are, we have one of the highest school fees in the area, 
The argument will be online learning is going to reduce school fees. That's why you can have to pay for all your textbooks through there. School fees and paper, we've taken paper out of a school fee. We figured the taxpayer should pay for paper. And bottom line, the shifting of school fees off of, off of the general revenue is to give more general revenue resources available for other expenses. Yes, Dave. I think I'll outside the box a little bit. I know that teachers have their staffs. Uh, in the military, you have ranks. So every rank gets paid the same. And the, and the teachers, the staffs get paid the same. No, well, maybe not, okay. But uh, my point is, if the schools in the United States are lagging in math and science, let's say, and you can, the, the people that are well qualified in math and science can get job, higher paying jobs elsewhere. So how, can't there be something that where perhaps if you got a good math or science teacher, you can pay them more because there's more of a need for them rather than just how long they've been in the school system? Well, it's an interesting question. One thing we did get in the contract, and I'm going to be curious to see if it's going to go anywhere, it's the, the cooperative and collaborative attempt to develop a compensation program for teachers that will eliminate the step schedule and do it based on performance. Now everybody knows OTES, OPEZ, you're, you're hearing all about it, how hard it is. It, it is what it is. In Colorado, there is a school that has a scale that says we have too many of these teachers, therefore their compensation will be in this range. We need more of these math teachers and science teachers, and therefore we go to try to attract them, and their compensation is here. So it exists, but it's a very serious reform measure that would have to occur in public education. And the collective bargaining agreement, usually in the step schedule normally, precludes that. So unless you have a willing other side where you can do what Fairborn did, which I still don't know how come they canceled all three of their collective bargaining agreements, and the teachers are still teaching. I don't know what contracts they're working on, but look it up, Fairborn, Ohio, just Google them. It's very rare, but they canceled all, I don't know why, I still don't know why, I didn't go that, we didn't go that strategy, I don't know the answer to that. They haven't been threatened with a strike to my knowledge, the teachers haven't given 10-day notice to my knowledge, Yet they're working on a contract. So maybe they work something out that's reformative, that's replicable, that's something that's there. Oakwood has a compensation program that uh, Oakwood, Oakwood Schools, that's supposed to be uh, performance based. I'm not really certain if it's that performance based at the end of the day, because it seems like that everybody will achieve the performance standard if everybody will get the raise. Um, so again, you have a lot of metrics you have to deal with when you're going through this. I mean, the other side of that. And I know they get compensated in some. I'm not real familiar with all the details. But you know, you have the sports program, and the coaches get extra compensation. So, and I know that there's different extracurricular activities like academia and stuff like that. And so there are teachers who get some kind of supplemental for sure. those kinds of things. But I mean, we tried the first year, and we put a pool of $100,000 and said, if anybody, any teacher or teachers want to get together and write a curriculum program, we'll give you a supplemental contract if we agree with your plan over the summer to write curriculum, to write something that we can replicate. we got to take yours. I tried again last week at my last board meeting and said, there's $75,000 still available for any teacher that wants to come up and write some curriculum and do something that's innovative to come forward for kids. I don't know if we're going to get it, but I looked at all the new administrators. I said, last year we had old administrators. This year we have new administrators. Maybe you guys can encourage somebody to do something really crazy and wacky and extreme. And do something good that might be able to be replicated and we can sell. That's unbelievable. Nobody took you up on that? No, sir. Nobody took us up on that. Do I understand that teachers no longer have to get master's degrees? I've heard that, but yet they are in their steps. They get compensated for master's. I haven't heard that, but if you, you have steps that go down, so the, the step increases in most schedules are big and aggressive the first 10 years on what they call the vertical step. The horizontal step typically are a number of years they go to school over and above. And if, you're, if your schedule says that, it doesn't matter what the law says, your schedule says that. The other thing, by the way, you know the uh, coaches camps, you mentioned coaches, those things should be running through your district too, because our coaches camps generated $130,000 last year for basketball, football, and baseball. So we did an 80-20 split with our coaches. And the district made $26,000 to our sports, and they took the rest and became all transparent. We believe we have some ethics violations with coaches getting direct payments in there. We're still waiting for the auditor to tell us we do it. And there's a lot of, we're going to have to go ahead and do lunch, guys, but you can keep talking. So David, last question. Go ahead, Molly. Uh, I just wanted to ask, how do you get the supplementals out of your negotiated contracts? And, and at my school, in our contracts, 
they have coaches getting vacation pay. They get the regular pay, supplemental oh, pay, oh, and if they do any type of practice in August or Christmas break, they get paid on top of that. Well, that's how well, you, you need something and they want something. That's you, again, it's this is this win-win thing. What is what is your goal? If it's if it's fiscally unsustainable, if it's unsustainable fiscally, then can you afford to keep doing that? I don't know. If that's your policy, you want to be sustainable. How is that? I don't know the answer. To that it's something they have to want to give up. They want something from you. So thank you all very much. I've got cards. So if anybody wants to ask a question.